All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Everything Municipal Concrete webinar. Uh, this webinar was uh, made possible by the collaboration with uh, Concrete Ontario, Municipal Engineers Association, and OGRA. My name is Amin Menena. I'm the uh, Technical Products and, uh, and Research Coordinator at the OGRA and the uh, MEA. And uh, we also have with us today Alan Carey, the Director of uh, Technical Services in Concrete Ontario, and Bart uh, Canters, the President of Concrete Ontario. Today we will be, uh, this, this webinar will take approximately uh, 60 minutes. We'll, and we recommend to, to you for, to, to stick around. We will be uh, handing out gift cards. Uh, We'll do a, a little quiz at the end and we'll hand out uh, prizes and gift cards in a total of uh, $200. So stick around until the end. Uh, you're all muted as participants. We encourage you to ask questions in the Q&A function uh, during any time at, the, at this webinar and we will answer your questions at the end. The webinar will be recorded and will be posted on the MEA website and also at the Concrete Ontario website. So first, uh, the first thing I'll, I'll give a brief uh, overview on the OGI Municipal Concrete Liaison Committee and the highlights. After that, we'll, uh, Alan Carey will uh, show us the latest OPSS concrete standards updates. And we'll talk about the new Municipal Exterior Flat Work Certification Program. And uh, last but not least, uh, Bart will talk about the low carbon concrete. And at the end, we, uh, we will do the, the quiz game and we'll hand out the gift cards. So in 2012, uh, the Municipal Concrete Liaison Committee was established due to uh, a collaboration between Concrete Ontario, Cement Association of Canada and the OGRA. All agreed that the three uh, will benefit to working together, to resolve any current or future concrete related issues. And therefore, they agreed to uh, to form a liaison committee to uh, to tackle any uh, issues. This committee's mandates include facilitation of development uh, of best practice guides, uh, developing of educational materials and educational programs, recommendations uh, of for updates to the concrete related OPS. Uh, standards and drawings. This committee is, uh, the, the value of this committee in, is, is in the people involved in it, the amount of experience and mostly the, the variety of stakeholders. It includes contractors, uh, consultants, municipal representations, uh, associations and uh, academic uh, representation as well. Our highlights include the development of uh, best practice uh, guides, the municipal concrete infrastructure, the municipal concrete paving guide, the municipal exterior flat work construction best practices guide. All of these guides are made available for free. You can access them in the handouts uh, in your uh, menu here in the webinar. And uh, I would also like to mention uh, or, or highlight uh, that we uh, last uh, February during the OGRA conference, we handed out the second uh, concrete municipal concrete award. And I would like to mention that the, the 2021 concrete uh, municipal concrete award application is now open. The application is also included in the, the handout uh, section. Uh, and uh, last but not least, again in the in the highlights is the municipal concrete paving webinars. So the the municipal concrete uh, award uh, were developed to to promote and recognize the the successful collaboration between municipalities and concrete producers and uh, and uh, consultants 
for excellence in innovation in municipal concrete projects in, uh, in Ontario. In 2019, which was the first uh, edition of this award, the winner was uh, the city of Vaughan and uh, Emma Concord for uh, their project of uh, the parking lot in uh, the 7-3 fire station at the city of Vaughan. 2020 uh, winner was also the city of Vaughan and the uh, Pine Valley uh, contractor and uh, work engineering as a consultant for uh, the reconstruction of pedestrian access at uh, Doring Gate Drive and Islington Avenue uh, for incorporating uh, best practice and, and uh, best use of products to, uh, to develop uh, an end product protected from weather conditions and for collaborating between municipalities, between the municipality uh, consultant and the con uh, contractor in addressing uh, site-specific challenges such as uh, saturated soil and uh, uh, conducting in situ tests as well to, to ensure the product meets the minimum design standards. And again, I would like to remind everyone to, uh, if we have municipal, um, I believe we do have quite a municipal attendance uh, today and uh, also contractors to uh, take a look at the, the application. The, the deadline is not until uh, December of 2021. So if you have, if you have a product that you know it's going to be uh, a good candidate, uh, you can just fill up the application. Uh, make sure to document with pictures and all that and uh, and submit it uh, for a chance to to get recognized as as uh, one of the finalists or the the winner of the 2021 uh, municipal concrete award uh, the brochure is also available in the handout so click on that save in your files for for reference and with that i'd like to pass it to uh, uh, alan for updates on OPS. Thank you, Amin. Hopefully you can okay. hear me. Um, yeah, somebody needs to really uh, dethrone the city of Vaughan and uh, win this award uh, this year. So really encourage everyone to submit uh, their applications. There's lots of projects out there, lots of different concrete applications, sidewalks, bridges, uh, even pavements. Um, so be sure to, uh, to take the uh, brochure from the handout section and fill it out and send it in um, so you can be recognized next year. Uh, so as Amin mentioned, my name is Alan Carey. I'm the Director of Technical Services at Concrete Ontario. Uh, Bart and myself uh, do sit on the OPS structures and uh, pavement committees. So we do have an inside scoop on all of the latest OPS as concrete standards that are being updated. What are some challenges? Um, and here's just a quick list I wanted to uh, make sure everybody's aware of. So OPSS Municipal 350 will be coming out uh, in November of this year. It's fully revised. There's all sorts of new requirements. The last time it was updated was uh, 1998. So it's long overdue. Um, the MTO does not use the specification. They have their own um, NSSP, but from the municipal side, uh, concrete pavements are starting to really um, showcase themselves all throughout the province. So this will be a great addition to some of the standards that are already out there. In terms of uh, sidewalks, you want to be aware of OPSS Municipal 351. The latest uh, revision is from 2019 currently, and uh, at that time we did introduce the ACI Flatwork Certification Program. It is the best uh, program that was available at the time, um, so we decided as a committee to include it. The City of Toronto has used it since about 2015, um, and it's very important to have some kind of requirement for Flatwork Certification to ensure that as an owner, you get the products that you're looking for. Um, and we were also able to update the, the long outdated 30 MPA concrete for sidewalks to 32 C2, which is the only mix uh, municipalities should be using in Ontario currently. Um, once again, we were looking at updating the spec. Um, so in November of this year, it would also come out again. Um, and at that point, we added the addition of uh, the Municipal Exterior Flatwork Certification Program, which is a brand new program I'm going to preview for you guys today. Um, it's been long overdue. Lots of contractors and uh, owners are looking for this certification. 
um, and I'll explain exactly why in a few minutes here. And uh, 353 is the curb and gutter spec. Again, very similar to the uh, sidewalk spec. It was debuted in 2019. We added the ACI flatwork certification. We added the 32C2. Um, and the spec will also include the new municipal exterior flatwork certification program in November. Um, and finally, if you want to know anything about concrete, you need to look at OPSS Municipal 1350, which is the material specification for concrete, uh, last updated again in 2019. And in that edition, uh, it was the full adoption of Portland Limestone Cement, which is a very new uh, product to our industry. Um, not so much in Europe, for example, but uh, it really ties in beautifully with uh, low carbon concrete. And Bart's going to give you guys an overview of that a little bit later. Okay. So I really want to preview the Municipal Exterior Flatwork Certification Program. Um, as I mentioned, this program is long overdue. It has been asked for by our industry for several years. Um, I mean, showed you guys that we did develop an exterior flatwork uh, best practices guide a few years back, um, which was really well received. And we kind of built on that guide and decided to create our own certification program to ensure that sidewalks, curbs, gutters, and concrete pavements um, will last and uh, owners can be happy with the final product. So what are some of the challenges and you know, why did we create this program? Um, so you can see here is just a quick example in Etobicoke. You know, too many times we see um, scaling, for example, we see mortar flaking, we see pop-outs, and uh, this panel at the time was only you know less than a year old. Um, so there's really no excuses on why this panel looks like this after only a year, um, and it's something we consider when creating this course. Other challenges, you know, you have uniform supports, for example, with uh, different soil conditions across the province. And also jointing is a, is a big factor when it comes to sidewalks, for example. So you can see uh, it sunk down on one side, kicked up on the other. Could be a combination of factors, whether it's uh, non-uniform support or perhaps this um, joint here, this expansion joint wasn't full depth, forcing the panel to kick up. Um, in the end, it does have to be ground down because it's a trip, uh, tripping hazard. And uh, overall, you know, this, this is way too soon to be fixing something like this. Other challenges you're going to see when it comes to exterior flat work, the public. Um, this was a project we did in Vaughan, and you can see we had people stepping over the curbs uh, and, and damaging them. So the contractor had to go back several times to fix the damage done, apply the curing compound over again. and uh, Obviously, foot, foot marks can be a problem overnight when people think they can just step on fresh concrete. Um, but this is, again, something we look at in the course and something uh, we look at the, the requirements of the specifications. And another challenge, salt usage. We all know salt has to be applied to concrete. Um, just from a safety aspect, trip and falls can be quite costly for our owners. Um, but unfortunately, it can damage the surface of the concrete. Um, you can see on the right side here, if properly placed, finished, and cured, concrete will outlast the mailboxes, for example. Um, but again, you need to ensure you're following all the latest specifications and that the concrete is properly placed, finished, cured, so they can last uh, when it is exposed to salts. And here's just some examples that there is hope. You know, not all concrete is going to fall apart. Uh, when it comes to flat work, uh, 1998, 1993, these are both examples from Etobicoke, and uh, they're still performing just as they were intended to in the beginning. So you really can't create a course um, unless you have support from the industry. And as I mentioned, the contractors have been asking for a, a different version to the ACI flat work. So I, I ended up reaching out to Tarba, Liuna, OGRA, MEA, Orba, the National Capital Heavy Construction Association out in Ottawa, and our partners, the Cement Association of Canada. And we all sat down and agreed that this course makes sense, and uh, it is something that the industry really needs. In terms of the program, so it's going to provide a comprehensive overview of municipal best practices and specifications, specifically regarding Ontario municipal concrete flat work applications. So we're not talking about, you know, things that are going on down in the States and how do they do how they how do they actually do things? Um, this course is primarily based on OPSS and OPSD documents 
and uh, it's exactly what co the contractors do uh, here in Ontario. It's meant to educate contractors, but also inspectors. So if you're an inspector and you have to go out and check on some of these job sites, it'll give you the knowledge what to look for um, and also whether the contractor is doing it properly. And also, it's also meant to you know, gather and spread knowledge about individual municipal practices. OPSS is just a guide when it comes to uh, flat work. For example, um, concrete needs to be unloaded within 90 minutes in OPSS. But the city of Ottawa, for example, allows up to two hours for sidewalks. So that's knowledge we can spread to the contractors and inspectors. And depending on you know, where the contractors are working in the province, they need to be aware of the different uh, specific municipal requirements. Um, and if two hours is better than 90 minutes for most municipalities, then we can always go back to the OPSS committees and we can update it uh, to ensure that we get the best possible specification out there. And the primary focus is to minimize deficiencies in the field. Now, you can't really have a course unless it's recognized. So first we had to have industry partners um, make sure that everybody's on board with the content. Um, so we have drafted the guide and uh, we will be sending it out again in the next few months to make sure everything's ironed out. But we did recognize the program in OPSS 350, 351, and 353 as of November 21. Uh, previously, the language was that you had to be you know, ACI flat work certified. Now the language has been changed that as part of the submission requirements, it's going to be as specified in contract documents, meaning you have options of this program, the ACI flat work certification, or an approved equivalent if something else ends up uh, coming down the line. But the flat work is still valid from ACI, it's just this course is tailored for our industry, is meant to really address the concerns here in Ontario, and uh, we really feel strongly that this is something that's going to be uh, very valuable to many municipalities. In terms of promotion, um, you know, we have been in talks with the City of Ottawa, Thunder Bay, Sudbury. Uh, there's many of you on the call here today um, who represent different types of municipalities. So we have done the legwork to get the, the name out there. Um, we are slowly telling people about this course to make sure that they're aware of it, that it's coming in November. Uh, we're not going to be rolling it out until at least next year to make sure it's you know fully recognized, that people are aware of the new specifications in November. Um, but we have been sending out these toques, for example, to a few contractors, one in Ottawa and a couple in the GTA. Um, and as you can see, they're all on board. They were happy to uh, wear the toques while they're doing exterior flat work. Um, now, our primary promotion will happen at the MEA virtual conference um, in AGM in the week of November 22nd. Um, really hope everybody on this call can join us uh, for MEA. Um, it will be virtual, unfortunately. Uh, we'd much rather have it in person and have a booth and talk with everyone um, when you do come to our booth. But uh, this is the next best thing. And, uh, you know, we will share a, a lot more information um, at the MEA virtual conference in November. So I think that's it for me, Amin. Um, I'll turn it over to you or just Bart. Bart, did you want to just take over here? Sure, I can jump right in. So thank you, Alan. So the next topic we wanted to touch on was low carbon concrete. Um, so again, a lot of discussions in the media regarding climate change and the impacts, and there's a lot of opportunity for everyone in the construction industry to do their part and try and advance uh, really the technology that we're using out on job sites. Let me click on this. There we go. So I'm just quickly going to go through a few things. There's a lot of opportunities for us when it comes to how can we reduce the carbon footprint. So uh, just to start off, I'll show a slide a little later, but uh, just to re recap, the uh, density of concrete is 2,300 kilograms per cubic meter. So we've got 2,300 kilograms of sandstone, cement, water, et cetera, in one cubic meter of concrete. And for the type of concrete that we supply to municipal projects, it's typically 32C2 or 35C1. Um, we're typically producing anywhere from 300 to 500 kgs of CO2. 
So we'll come back and we'll show some tools on what we use to calculate that and we can walk through what's involved. So first off, we'll start off all construction materials. Everyone's looking at how can we try and reduce the amount of embodied carbon or CO2 that's in each of the construction products that we're using. So again, it's still critical to ensure long life and durability, but for in many cases, really what we're looking at is how do we provide high strength? How do we provide low permeability? How do we provide long life? And CO2, if we went back 10 years ago, wasn't something that many people were talking about, but there's definitely a lot of opportunities now. So when we're looking at the embodied carbon in the material, it's what is the amount of carbon that's produced to generate that raw material? So for us in the concrete industry, uh, it's cement production, and that's a, a component we'll talk about in more length. It's extraction of sand and stone from the ground for aggregates. That's 70% of the material that we're using. It's blending in admixtures and water at the concrete plant. And then from a concrete plant standpoint, our primary contribution to CO2 is really diesel fuel. So again, we're using ready, ready mix trucks. We've got over 4,000 certified ready mix trucks in the province and we're burning diesel fuel both to mix the concrete and to deliver the concrete out to the site. So about 60% of the energy that we use in a truck is for mixing, and the other 40% is just to get the truck to and from the site. Uh, what other people are looking at is what's the embodied carbon of the infrastructure. So now the first component deals with the individual products, then we hand it over to a contractor and we construct something. So again, people are starting to look at how can we optimize our overall design to have lower impacts when it comes to the construction elements that we're building. So when we look at where our carbon sources are, um, so some generic data here. So number one, industry produces about 30%. Building operations, so heating and cooling on a day like today, it's really electricity use as we are trying to cool our buildings. Uh, con building con materials and construction is about 11%, and transportation, so people just driving on, on the roads, uh, personal vehicles, heavy truck traffic, et cetera, 22%. So the, the marketplace that you're most actively involved in, about 22%. Uh, we will talk a little bit about buildings, but today it's going to be more about uh, uh, pavements and roads and sidewalks and curbs. Uh, but again, there's a lot of opportunities there. There's, when it comes to carbon, what there's two components to consider. There's the initial construction impact, so how much CO2 is in the construction materials that we're using, but then there's the operational life. So for infrastructure, it's typically 30 or 50 years, and that includes how many times you're gonna have to go back and maintain the pavement, do maintenance work, whether it's concrete or asphalt, what's your repair schedule. So really what people are trying to do is not think about things as what's the, if I'm buying a material, what's the upfront part? That's the embodied part shown here in blue. Uh, but then it's think about if I've got a 30 year or 50 year service life uh, for whatever asset it is, I have to start quantifying what's the impacts over the full service life. So the idea is that we take it from initial design to demolition and we analyze the whole thing and we pick something that offers the lowest impact to the environment. And that's really the key. And that's really where concrete fits in too, because we're really synonymous with durability and long life. So again, I'll just cover a few quick things. Obviously in the building space, uh, architects and engineers have been very proactive over the last 10 to 20 years in promoting uh, life cycle cost analysis and trying to get to net zero. So again, there's a lot of in interest there and a lot of benefits that can be implemented in these types of things. Uh, we've got the Canadian Green Building Council uh, promoting their zero carbon building initiative. So again, it's trying to think about how can I build more efficiently? How can I use things like solar or other passive methods to generate uh, energy and try and reduce the impacts on the overall environment. When it comes to uh, cement, the Global Cement and Concrete uh, Association has got an ambition to be net zero by 2050. So that's a pretty, it's, it's a fair ways out, but it's a very ambitious goal. And I think it's a very doable goal. So again, it's looking at where, what are the 
uh, CO2 intensive components in the production of concrete and how can we minimize those components very quickly in the short term and then in the long term develop new technologies like carbon capture uh, to grab the carbon that's being for for example that's being generated during cement production how can we uh, capture that CO2 and how can we use concrete to uh, sequester it and store it so there's lots of different options there that we can look at so we'll just jump back to cement and concrete um, so again one of the reasons why uh, concrete is one of the first areas that we're looking at is it's the most used construction material in the world so um, it's more used than every other construction material combined so often the stat thrown out is that water is the only thing that's more used than concrete so we've got uh, 4 billion tons of cement and over 20 billion tons of concrete that are produced globally every year. So concrete is a local material. We're using local sand and stone, local cement to build in a local community. We've got that 90 minute delivery radi radius that we have in uh, the OPS specifications for typically delivering concrete. So again, because it's so used in such a large quantity, there's huge opportunities for trying to reduce our carbon footprint. So again, when you look at the significant sources of GHGs, um, again, you've got iron and steel, 28, cement, 27, uh, petrochemical and chemical industry, 13%. So again, cement is a fairly big component. We're about 8% of the global emissions come from cement production and cements while it's used in small quantities, is one of the critical components, obviously, for concrete. So when we look at the material, uh, where is the concrete, or where's the CO2 embodied? Um, so most of it is, 89% of it, is in the materials itself. So again, it's the raw components that we use. Um, cement represents about 80% of all of the CO2 that's in concrete. Again, it's only 10 to 12% of the material, but it's about 80% of the CO2. Uh, then we got 4% in transportation to get it out to the site, uh, and then crushing it or demolishing it, again, fa fairly small components. If we were to look at a standard, let's say, six to 10-story building, um, from a CO2 perspective, concrete's gonna make up about 52% of the, of the CO2 in that building. And then you've got the other construction materials that you use for uh, mid to high rise construction. So it's a fairly big component. So uh, let's go back to the basics. Where is all of this CO2 coming from? So one of the key components is the cement. So we're basically taking limestone and clay, we're heating it up to 1400 degrees and we're creating clinker. So in that process, there's really two key uh, CO2 sources. First, the first one, which is about a third of the CO2, is the fuel source that we need, the natural gas or whatever material that we're using to burn to generate that heat. So about a third of the CO2 is coming from having to heat the limestone and clay up to that 1400 degrees. The other two thirds comes from the chemical reaction as clinker is made. So basically it's, calcification is the, the term, but we're basically heating the limestone up to a molten material. It's releasing the elements and CO2 is, is being driven off during that chemical process and going out the stack. So when we jump back to concrete and we look at it, well, what's the component of cement in concrete? It's typically seven to 15% we're saying here. Uh, the material itself is primarily sand and stone, so that's sand and stones making up about 70 or 75 percent. And then we've got water for municipal applications. We're almost always adding air treatment for freeze thaw protection, and then a small quantity of chemical admixture. But it's that cement component where the majority of the CO2 is coming from. So again, going back to those processes, what can we do um, when it comes to that first third combustion? We have to look at are there alternative fuels that are waste products from other processes that we could use instead of sending them to a landfill, let's use them uh, in the heat generation process. So again, there's a lot of research work that's going on on new materials. Uh, Ontario is maybe a little farther behind than some of the other provinces, uh, but there's a lot of work that can be done there to try and address that fuel source. 
The other major component, the two thirds from that chemical reaction, we have to look at what can we do to try and reduce that. So again, we can look at blended cements, um, S supplementary cementing materials, a few other things. Uh, there's a lot of research that's going on into carbon capture. So in the cement industry, uh, they don't estimate what their CO2 emissions are, they actually measure them. And there's a lot of active research projects that are out there looking at how can we capture the CO2 and then use it in another chemical process. So that's a huge opportunity for reductions. So jumping in, we talked a little bit about on the heating side, it's looking at, for example, uh, asphalt shingles, so construction waste, medical waste. Is there things where we're heating uh, the limestone up to 1400 to 1600 degrees? It's higher than uh, the temperatures used in incineration, municipal incineration. Um, so we've got a very good opportunity to use alternative fuel sources. And we wanna look at being able to do that as much as possible. There's also some new technologies out there, again, using biosolids and hydrogen, other things that the industry is looking at. So again, there's probably a potential to, to save about 33% there. The other one that's been addressed in the OPS standards is Portland limestone cement. So that's just blending in uh, with conventional GU cement, there's about 5% limestone. So it's, it's uh, the, rock material that hasn't gone through the cement kiln that we run with the clinker through a ball mill to create the fine cement powder. So instead of just using 5% in Portland limestone, we increase that to up to 15%. And because that limestone didn't go through the cement kiln, it has a much lower uh, carbon footprint and we can get about 10%, eight to 10% reductions in CO2 from that. And then the last technology that a number of companies are looking at right now is how can we capture at the cement plant the actual CO2 that's coming out of the stack? And can we find other uses for it? Or can we use concrete to permanently sequester and store that CO2 so it's not released to the environment? So I think that's where a lot of the focus is uh, currently being put into right now. So let's get back to what you could do. So. Conc well, we got a bunch of slides coming in here. So when it comes to infrastructure, what do we care about? We care about strength, we care about durability, we care about long-term performance. So when it comes to what can we do on the concrete side, uh, Portland limestone cement is an absolute no-brainer and we're utilizing a lot of that in Ontario right now. We wanna look at things like optimizing mix designs to reduce the higher CO2 components. And we wanna get into uh, material efficiency and recyclability. And we wanna get into things like curing. So again, lovely sidewalk, make it white please. And we'll be all right. So as we talked about before, concrete is synonymous with long life and durability. That's uh, really what goes hand in hand. And so one of our key objectives is to making sure whatever we do to the material, we don't negatively impact its long-term performance. So that's one of the critical issues. So again, with concrete, you've got the ability to uh, repurpose structures. We've seen a number of buildings where a uh, hundred year old building has been gutted and then the concrete structure used as the base and then long-term uh, housing generated in those types of locations, affordable housing. So again, once you've built something out of concrete, it does have a very long life. When it comes to the concrete itself, then what are the real impacts? So I mentioned before, um, we need to start quantifying what the actual CO2 is in a cubic meter of concrete. So if we look at the CRMCA industry average EPD for concrete, this is an average for the whole country. And we look at concrete that's between 31 and 35 MPA in compressive strength. We see that at its lowest end, it's 260 kgs of CO2 per cubic meter. And at the high end, it's uh, 450 basically. So what's the difference? What's the high end? Well, the high end is 100% GU cement and nothing else. So if you're, if you're just using GU cement, uh, then you're gonna have the highest possible carbon footprint. How do we reduce that carbon footprint? We start implementing other technologies like Portland limestone cement, get a 10% reduction from that. And then we can start looking at supplementary cementing materials like slag and fly ash. There's also new chemical admixtures coming out 
um, again, for optimizing mix designs to reduce uh, carbon impacts. So there's a lot of things that we can do. And there's a lot of pressure for the industry to move to environmental product declarations that clearly identify what the CO2 is. Another thing we have to highlight uh, from a technical standpoint, uh, like we said before, when we're producing cement, we're generating CO2 from the combustion and that calcination of the limestone. But over time, concrete does absorb CO2. So we call it carbonation. Uh, it takes time, it's impacted by the surface area of the concrete. So the more surface area you have, the faster uh, concrete absorbs CO2 from the air, but it, it absorbs about one quarter back over the life of the concrete. So again, from a structural standpoint, we wanna be concerned about that. If we've got reinforcing steel in bridges and elements like that, we don't wanna see a huge amount of carbonation because it lowers the pH of the concrete and leaves it more susceptible to corrosion. But for things like curb and sidewalk, if we, if when we're done with their service life, let's say they're 30, 40, 50 years old, and we're ripping them out, we can crush that material. When we crush the material, we give it a very large surface area, and we can use that granular material either back in concrete or as a granular base for new construction. And if you're using it on a granular base, then you've got maximum surface area to absorb CO2 again. So again, we're seeing a lot of research into what we can do there. So let's get, get down to the guts of this. Um, from a practical standpoint, what can you do on your projects? So we'll look at the different factors that we're gonna get into here. So I'll start by violating one of the cardinal rules of the Ready Mix Concrete Association, which is never tell anyone what the mix design is. Never, never reveal the mix proportions. But for the purpose of understanding where the CO2 comes from, and what kind of technologies or methodologies we should be using to reduce it. I'll break that this one time, as long as this isn't recorded. Don't tell me it is, Alan. So if we took an example of a hypothetical mix design that was say a 35 MPA C1 concrete, and we look at the mix proportions here, uh, I've used, there's a number of calculators out there. I've used the CGF calculator just because it does a good, good job of breaking out the individual components so you can see where the CO2 comes from. So for this particular mix design, uh, the, the concrete's got 385 kgs of CO2. So where does it come from? If we look at the GU cement, 285 kgs, it's basically one, one kg of CO2 for every kg of cement that we're putting in. So this is, this is driving it. We look at slag. So slag is produced locally here in the Ontario marketplace. It's a byproduct from the steel industry. Uh, because it's a byproduct from the steel industry, the only CO2 contributions that, the, that have to apply to concrete relate to the processing that we have to do to use it. So the CO2 impacts of producing steel are tied to steel. The waste product that's left over from the steel industry, we have to grind down into a small particle size so that we can use it. So we have to account for the processing and we have to account for the trucking uh, back to the concrete plant but it's significantly lower than the impacts from the GU or the GULs. Next major component, sand and stone. So that's that 65 to 75% of the mix design. So again, both sand and stone have a carbon footprint. So again, it's extraction of the material from the natural environment, it's screening, it's washing, it's uh, prepping, it's trucking back to the concrete plant. All of those processes have a carbon impact that we have to account for. So it's not zero. And then even water, uh, especially I think the highest impact is usually when we're using municipal water in our urban, center, urban settings. But again, you've got processing, you've got tr water treatment that generates CO2, we have to account for that. Uh, the one thing that's missing here uh, when it comes to raw materials, but it was critical to the overall success of concrete is admixtures. So their volume is so small. We still account for it. We still do the calculations when it comes to admixtures, but typically in a cubic meter of concrete, their volume is so small, they, it doesn't meet the reporting requirements, but that's still in there. And there's a lot of opportunities when it comes to using admixtures to reduce the CO2. 
So going back to this, this table, really what it comes down to is how can we use the lowest carbon concrete or cement possible? So the first thing that we do to look at this is immediately get rid of this GU cement and replace it with GUL. There's a 10% reduction right off the bat. So we'll start walking through some of the steps that we can take out on job sites. So the first one is uh, ensure proper testing. Why is testing important? Uh, because we don't, we need to know that the evaluation of the product is going to give a fair value of what the concrete's properties actually are. So when you order 32 MPA sidewalk, we shouldn't have to send you 50 MPA concrete in order to make sure that we're not going to have failures when it's, for example, 35 degrees outside today, like it is right now. Um, so again, one of the critical issues that all of us have to do is ensuring proper testing so that we can optimize the mix design to minimize over design. So from a concrete producer standpoint, uh, we just don't want to run into potential test result failures. So it's simpler just to over design the mix and avoid problems. So ultimately that's not a solution that's going to work in the long term. So again, we need to have properly trained people, CCIL, or ACI certified people out in the field doing the testing, we need to have good distribution of test results so everybody knows what's going on, and we need to address things like cylinder storage at job sites to make sure that we're properly evaluating the product. Then the concrete industry can dial back that over design that we have in the mixes, but that could have a big impact. Next one is looking at what's the appropriate volume, and do you need that volume of concrete? So again, it can have a fairly high CO2 impact. So again, from a design standpoint, if I went with a higher strength, but a much smaller uh, column size, could that benefit the overall structure? So as we move into an era where we start quantifying for each of our mixed designs, what the CO2 impacts are, then we can start looking at from a design standpoint, how do we optimize for the right size of concrete elements out, out on the job site? Mentioned Portland limestone cement a few times. Again, we're probably at 50 plus uh, percent usage here in Ontario. So we've had it for quite a while. Again, it's a straight one-to-one -one replacement from a concrete producer standpoint. There's nothing you have to change in the mix design. You just take out the GU, you replace it with the GUL, and you've got eight to 10% CO2 reduction because of its lower uh, carbon footprint. So again, we're seeing a lot of that uh, being used, we're encouraging its use across the country, and definitely that's going to have a positive impact as we move forward. And then lastly, we get into uh, supplementary cementing materials, so slag and fly ash. So why are they such a good, good idea? So from a technical standpoint, they tend to lower the permeability of concrete and increase the strength. So they provide a lot of the performance properties that we're looking for, but if we went back to that one slide, which I should have never showed you, which was mixed proportions, the impact of slag from a CO2 standpoint is negligible. So the more SCM that we can put into the mix, the lower the carbon footprint of the concrete itself. So again, when we get into mass concrete elements, like if we're doing, a, let's say a two meter base slab for a downtown condo, that's gonna be 40 stories high. Um, again, there's a there's a great application for 50, 60, 70 percent SCM usage, because again, you've got a really thick layer of concrete that's going to generate a lot of heat. That heat's going to be a problem, so that's another reason to use SCMs. But it's really going to reduce the carbon footprint of the concrete. So we need to look for those uh, optimization challenges. Admixture optimization is the last thing that we talked about. Again, so we want to make sure that we've got Admixtures that can minimize the or maximize the water, minimize the water cement ratio, give us high performance, allow us to pull uh, any of the high CO2 products out. And again, there's a lot of new specialty admixtures that are out there. Um, from a specifying standpoint, we don't see minimum cement contents anymore, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but again, we don't want to see people specifying products that the concrete producer hasn't used before. As soon as you add in a new product that the concrete producer has no history with, the immediate thing they're going to do is up the cement content to account for the risk because they don't know what the long-term impact is if they haven't used that product. 
we're seeing a lot of new products coming out. So uh, Carbon Cure and Blue Planet, for example. So Carbon Cure adding CO2 directly to the plastic concrete during the production process, uh, positive impacts there. Blue Planet is a company that's using CO2 and uh, crushed concrete to create synthetic aggregate. So it's a, it's a man-made generated aggregate that's made from CO2. So it's, its carbon footprint is negative. So instead of being positive, it's a negative value. So there's a lot of opportunity there with products like that. And we're looking for more of those products over time. And we talked about uh, carbon absorbing CO2 over, over its lifestyle. So again, I'll just take a quick example. Uh, we, we also, one of the other awards programs in the province is the Ontario Concrete Awards. So I'll pick on a, a contractor that is uh, a road builder, a concrete producer, an asphalt contractor, an aggregate producer, good on the list. But Tomlinson, when they built their uh, core office building in Ottawa a few years ago, again, they were looking at uh, creating a large facility it only had 7,000 cubic meters of concrete in it, but again, they were looking for ways to optimize the mix. So again, they're looking at high performance concrete, uh, using self-consolidating concrete where applicable to try and bring uh, the thickness of elements down, using SCMs wherever possible, uh, putting color into the concrete and leaving exposed columns and floors open as much as possible to reduce other construction materials. And then even using things like uh, internal concrete temperature sensors. So again, they're building a building during cold weather, winter months. They want to use, instead of the generic, as soon as it gets cold, we take all the supplementary cementing materials out. They looked at how many... Let, if we measure the actual temperature of the concrete and we calculate the maturity of the concrete in the field, let's see how much SCMs we can still use in cold weather months. So again, you got a lead designated building, exposed concrete throughout. They were targeting 20% CO2 reductions, uh, saved about 560 tons of CO2 in the whole project. And again, looking at how can we work together? So it's an, an example of the contractor, the designer, and the material supplier all trying to work together to optimize for CO2. And I think it's really a new way of the entire construction industry looking at products and trying to work together. So there's some extra challenges there. But again, you wind up with an extremely durable, extremely energy efficient building and exposed concrete throughout. So that being said, uh, we've Again, concrete is an, an essential construction material. It's a local material. We use it in every community across the country. Uh, it's synonymous with durability. And we've got a lot of opportunities by using Portland limestone cement, by using supplementary cementing materials, by using new and innovative admixtures and additives to the concrete to try and reduce that overall carbon footprint and try and get to our goal of being net zero by 2050. So that said, I will stop my presentation there. All right, thank you very much, Bart, for that uh, informative presentation. Let me open the questions tab and see if we have any questions already. And uh, as I do so, I'd like to encourage everyone, uh, all the attendees, uh, please type in your questions at the Q&A function. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we'll I got some questions here as well. I can uh, okay. read them here. Uh, I guess this question is for Bart. Uh, if municipalities are considering specifying low carbon concrete, who can they reach out to? Great question. I, I would say Alan Carey would be my <laughs> first answer. But uh, again, talking to their concrete producer about what can be done. I know that we're, we work in partnership with the Cement Association of Canada. So again, that's where I see venues like the Municipal Engineers, Ontario Good Roads, and the associations working together. We're really breaking into new ground here. And we're looking at, it's a new way of looking at things. Again, one of the benefits of Ready Mix Concrete is the fact that we supply a plastic product that can be formed into any shape that you can construct out on the job site. We can give the contractor whatever initial performance properties they're, they're looking for while still at the end giving the owner the final durability and strength that they need. 
for the project to work. So I think the challenge for us now is if we're looking at things like using more supplementary cementing materials, again, we've got to look at where is the proper space to do that. There's there's some locations where it maybe doesn't make a huge amount of sense, but I use the example of uh, a three meter thick raft slab underneath a, a 40 story office tower. Like that is an absolute no brainer to use Portland limestone cement and as much supplementary cementing materials as you can possibly get. Because again, that isn't that building load isn't gonna be applied for months or years to that element. And you've got a massive thickness of concrete that is going to generate a whole bunch of thermal issues anyway. So you get the benefit of better performance, higher long-term strength, plus low carbon. Now, when you get into municipal infrastructure applications, it gets a little tougher when you've got uh, freeze-thaw cycles and salt being applied to elements. So again, I'd look for elements that have less freeze-thaw exposure as areas for where can we maximize? But I think that's going to be the challenge for all the associations over the next few years is stepping back and looking, what are we doing right now? And where where is the smart places to implement these kind of kind of changes? And how much incremental change can we drive quickly? And then in the meantime, the raw material side, there's a lot of research going on to try and bring those raw material numbers down as well. Yeah, I mean, looks like we have a couple Thanks. more in, in the chat. Yeah, uh, I believe that one is uh, for you, Ellen. Uh, are there any? Oh, uh, I missed that one. Uh, there was one question asking: with the PLC uh, concrete, uh, would that be uh, allowed in the OPS standard? I'll defer to Bart because he sits on the OPS uh, structures committee, and they took care of that a couple of years ago. Yeah, so uh, again, the Ministry of Transportation through the designated source materials list has, has adopted Portland Limestone Cement. It's on the approved materials list for use both in municipal projects and provincial projects. Uh, prior to that, we've probably been using it for four or five years on the commercial uh, front as well. So again, from a specification standpoint, uh, last five years, it's it's been available for use. Really, our challenge in the concrete industry is transitioning over to a new material. So we're slowing the cement industry down from the standpoint of not quickly being able to uh, switch over. But we're we're definitely well in the process now. But it's definitely usable. And you're again, go back and look at your Form A <laughs> mixed design submission and see what it says there. You might already see that it says. Uh, PLC right on it. Thanks, Bart. Uh, are there any resources for uh, concrete CO2 reduction in terms of literature studies or best practice guides? That's really what we're in the process of doing right now. And I know uh, Alan has to roll out the municipal training program this year, uh, but the, sec, the next one of the future projects that we want to do in partnership with the other associations is uh, low carbon reduction. So we've got some generic documents that relate to utilizing SCMs. Uh, we're in the process as an industry of updating our industry average uh, EPD, so our environmental product declarations state to seven decimal places what our uh, CO2 uh, contribution is for individual mixes. So we're in that process of updating it over the next six six months. Our EPD expires, I think it's January 6th, 2022. So over the next six months, we're in the process of updating that. And then I think really what we're going to see over the next couple of years is more tools out there um, to evaluate this. So at this at the, this standpoint right now, typically what happens Again, being blunt, it's a low bid world. So you don't get the project unless you're low bid. But now we're seeing people ask the question of, okay, now that I've got my contractor and I've got my supplier, um, how can I implement uh, lower carbon strategies in this project? And that's where we're using tools like the Global Cement and Concrete Association's calculator to say, okay, my base mix design had, let's say 10% slag. What's the incremental value of moving to 15% or 20%? But then we also need to talk to the contractor about 
okay, does this have any impacts on early strength development? And does this fit with the schedule? And are there exposure conditions? So I think that's really where we're where we're going. Thank so you, we need Bart. some more work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't see any more questions uh, coming up. Uh, well, I got a, I got a couple here. I mean, just uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, uh, Ellen. So it kind of all ties in with the course. Uh, so what is the main difference between the new course and ACI flat work? Uh, the biggest difference is ACI flat work also looks after you know the industrial floor slab aspect so you're looking at power floating you're looking at flatness levelness it's a lot of work that you know exterior flat work contractors are not going to be doing they don't use the same type of equipment they don't use the same type of procedures um, so the new course is primarily based on sidewalks and curbs in a municipal setting and you don't have to worry about all the other aspects like you know how to finish an industrial floor slab um, like ACI flat work has. And then I had a couple ties in in there. Um, if the new course will be adopted in November, when will the first course be hosted? Uh, so officially the spec does come out in November, but we are looking at uh, January, 2022, um, and we will have sessions that will be virtual and then written exams all across the province. Um, but we will provide an update at MEA. Okay, yep. ahead, some, of the, some of the other questions here. Some masonry block companies are using carbon cure for cement masonry units. So for the precast industry, again, capturing CO2 and then for non-reinforced elements, for you directly inject, you let the concrete get gain some initial strength and then you literally uh, hit it with CO2. It can significantly increase the strength of the concrete element while absorbing CO2 and locking it into the matrix of the cement. So in the precast industry, um, again, it's a little outside of our area, but uh, there's definitely some options for grabbing that captured CO2 and using it in, in cement-based products. So that's one thing. And then the next question here is, what's a better salt to apply on a residential driveway? Well, I know what my answer is. Alan, do you want... Do you want that one? Um, I guess stay away from magnesium chlorides. They're they're terrible when it comes to uh, when your ambient temperatures are above you know three four degrees. Uh, they can really destroy your concrete. But you shouldn't be putting uh, salts down within the first year, anyways. Um, is there a safe salt, Bart? <laughs> yeah, it's called sand. Yeah. So just use <laughs> exactly. that. Exactly. So my answer would be no salt. Yeah. But uh, if it's your driveway sand if it's somebody else's driveway well then use what you want but uh, that's a bad attitude <laughs> okay that's all i see for questions here all right uh okay well thank you uh alan and bart uh we'll i guess we'll start with the with the Kahoot quiz and uh we'll give everyone a chance to uh, to participate and uh, and win uh, yeah, so MEA is giving away how how much? $200? Uh, yep, we in total of $200. Uh, first prize, uh, $100. Second prize, uh, $75. Third prize, $25. So basically, uh, we'll, we'll give you a... Uh, there you go. Uh, you, get the, you go to uh, kahoot.it and then... Uh, yeah, we'll have all, all, all the all background over here. To, Will, will help us uh, set it up. Yep. So basically, uh, the, the theme of it, you'll get the code, you go to the website, you enter the code, you log in with your email so that we can reach you and uh, give you the price. So that's the code. Uh, and if, uh, in a few seconds, we'll, we'll launch the, the quiz. You will see a question. Use your uh, cell phone to just select the answer as a remote. Read the question on the screen. Uh, because you won't be able to see it on your phone. You only you will be see the the answers on on the phone. And uh, well, we have some questions. So hopefully the the first few you get the hang of it, and then it'll be quick. And you will be rewarded in how fast you get the answer. All the questions will be related to this webinar, of course. So uh, yeah, make sure you get it right, and you get it right fast. And make sure you have an email that we can reach you on.
And HR appropriate uh, nicknames as well. Exactly. <laughs> I'll give people here a couple of minutes. Um, Bart, this presentation is being recorded, so we'll have to burn it uh, in terms of that uh, cement content that you showed. I should have known better. I should have asked before I did it. <laughs> it was nice working here. <laughs> well, I'm sure the municipal engineers are, are happy with that you did that. <laughs> Almost got 20, that's good. All right, we'll keep coming up. I'll give people a few more seconds. Get in there quickly, everyone, because we will uh, start and Okay, should we go ahead and start? Let's do it. Oliver, kick us off. First question, which city are home both 2019 and 2020 of the Array Concrete Award? Again, the faster you answer, the more points you will get. Alan, I think you got some hate mail coming from one side in particular, <laughs> too, for your comments earlier. <laughs> Okay, question two. When is the 2021 NBA virtual conference in ABM? of municipal exterior flat work certification will be coming in November, December, January, April. I'll give you a hint. OPS only publishes in November and April. <laughs> Let's either one of those. Who's in the money? Alex, HC, and T Bay. <laughs> Four questions left. Over time, concrete absorbs CO2. True or false? questions and we still have a chance to make a comeback. Three left. Use of Portland cement, limestone cement PLC helps to reduce CO2 by approximately how much? Bart did emphasize on that in his presentation, but if you tell Perfect, nice, okay. Alex, hang it on. <laughs> so tight. Uh, use of supplementary cementing materials such as slag significantly improves concrete vertical performance. Is that true or false? Okay. 
ask questions. Worth double the point. Oh, double the points. Oh. <laughs> Okay. Our moderator for today's webinar is. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Good job, Oliver. <laughs> Even I can tell the difference. That's a tricky one. All right. Oh. <laughs> Third place, and congratulations, okay. CCA. All right, wow. GT. What happened, Alex? <laughs> Congrats, uh, GT, CCA, and N. <laughs> so, uh, we will be sending you the gift cards to your emails uh, soon. That was very fun. And uh, thanks to Oliver uh, in the background helping us with this uh, quiz. Uh, at the end, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Concrete Ontario, uh, OGRA, and, and MEA for, for collaborating and hosting this. Uh, thank you, Alan and Bart for your presentations were very informative and on time as well. Excellent. And just remember, we're a not-for-profit association, so feel free to reach out and ask Alan or Oliver any questions you want. <laughs> just don't ask me them. But those other two guys can help you out anytime you want. There's no charge for that. Uh, again, we, we thank you for your passion and using our material. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Amin. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everyone, for joining and listening to today's webinar. Have a good day.